Thanks for checking out this week's message. No matter where you are, we hope that you'll be inspired and know that you're part of our one family. If you enjoy the ministry of our church, you can help us share messages like this by supporting us financially. Just press the give button at onechurchsc.org. It's quick, easy, and secure. Now let's prepare our hearts for this week's message. Look at the same verse of scripture that we started last week. Uh, Numbers uh, chapter 7, it's in the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. I'm going to run through those verses and get to uh, the second installment of our, our new series called Momentum. Uh, as we approach this year, in the beginning of 2019, we want to continue to have that movement, that momentum that God has caused us to finish the year with. And doing that, I wanted to break it down. And, and really, uh, it has taken me, it probably taken me several weeks to get through each one of these. Uh, we talked about structural momentum last week. And I'll put that in context in just a moment, a little bit of remedial uh, for you, and then we'll look today at systematic momentum. You with me? Say amen. Go Tigers. Amen. Great speech yesterday, right? Great speech. Some of you said, no, not really. I didn't care. No, I don't really care about football. It was a great speech. Great speech. Uh, I'm thankful that we have folks in our area that love the Lord and will lead as he leads. And so it's exciting. Numbers chapter 7. Starting in verse uh, 1, and we'll read there. On the day Moses set up the tabernacle, he anointed it and set it apart as holy. He also anointed and set apart all its furnishings and the altar with its utensils. Verse 2. Then the leaders of Israel, the, tribe, the tribal leaders who had registered the troops, came and brought their offerings. Verse 3. Together they brought six large wagons and twelve ox. Of course, we established last week they have two ox per wagon, and they were going to use that to continue to keep the tabernacle moving. When he would say to move, when it was time to move, this is how they would break it down and how that they would, they would move it, all right? There was a wagon for every two leaders and an ox for each leader. They presented these to the Lord in front of the tabernacle. Then the Lord said to Moses, receive their gifts and use these oxen and wagons for transporting the tabernacle. Distribute them among the Levites according to the work they have to do. So Moses took the wagons and oxen and presented them to the Levites. Now, you may, you, those of you that are with me last week, you already understand where I'm going with this. There may be some of you that are new to this that are going, how in the world does this have anything to do with momentum? What is, what is, this, what is this? How is he going to make this work? And don't we normally talk about stewardship in January and all that good stuff? And I'm going I'm to bring all that into context very, very quickly. I want to spend a lot of time uh, on anything remedial. Uh, but it, 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 is, it blows my mind. I shared just a portion of this this week uh, at the uh, maintenance department. Most of you know, if you follow me, uh, sometime back I got an opportunity. Uh, there's a group of guys that meet uh, in the county in the uh, uh, maintenance department, the road department. I don't know what the exact title of the place is. And they do prayer and they, they uh, have a devotional time. And so uh, they invited me to, to help be a part of that. And so I go over there and I was sharing just a little bit of this. And the same response I got last Sunday is the same response I got after I left their group. They said they'd never looked at how God said to break the tabernacle down and how that really equates to us as the temple of God. So I know God is stirring something and doing something with these verses, all right? A couple of things before I get into it. Hey, will y'all give, will y'all give the Lord a hand? My brother and his wife are up from, uh, from uh, in town with us for a while, man. It's so good to have my, my, my kid brother. Some of you... Uh, I've never met him, and that's okay. He sees the worst side of me. No, uh, my best friend. So it's so good to have him. And, and uh, they said his, their, their children's over there said they're already pistols. I was like, yeah, but that's Hendrix blood. That's how it works. So, so we're so glad you're here uh, with us this morning, Brandon and Sarah. Now, back to main subject. How does this equate to us? All right? Well, in Numbers chapter 3, you, you, you're with me, right? Okay. In Numbers chapter 3, before we get to chapter 7, the Lord tells him how to break the tabernacle down. And he tells him in the tribe of Levite how he's going to do that, how he would divide that up. What's interesting to me is that God, he breaks it down into three sections, okay? Numbers chapter 3, that's just for you to cross-reference later if you hadn't already this past week. He wants it broke down in three sections. He wants it broke down by, first of all, the poles, all right? And he assigned one part of the family to take care of the poles of, of the tent. The second part that he would have transported or to be moved in momentum was the tent or the coverings, all right, that, that took care of the Holy of Holies, that covered that. And the third one was the articles that went in the Holy of Holies. And, it's, and again, it may just be the Bible geek in me, but I think it's just absolutely incredibly awesome that he broke it down into three sections. 
Why? Because I think it's interesting that God is a triune God, and he created us in his image, and we are triune beings. We are mind, body, spirit, or soul, right? And so when he did that, he's doing it in, div in a divine way. Now, how, how in the world can we go from the Old Testament over to the New Testament and say, how does that apply to us? Well, I told you this last week, very quickly this week, that where does the spirit live now? It lives in you. And Paul would say, Did you, you, do, don't you know that your body is the temple or tabernacle of God? That he abodes in you? Remember Jesus said that in John 15? He said, if you abide in me and I you know, he abode, that he lives inside of us. What is it that we are commanded to do? We are commanded to go into all the nations, to preach, to teach, to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, to observe those things that he taught us, to love and to live for Christ. To be mobile, you can't spill God and gospel without go. It's about going forward. It's, I know it's cheesy, but it is what it is. All right? It's about moving forward. I like what was said. You have eyes in the front of your head so that you continue to move forward. That's the way life is intended, that we continue to move forward, and we are to be mobile. Now, you and I, to keep this momentum, understand that, that it has broken those three sections. And so the first one was the poles. That is the structural momentum. That's the foundation. That if there's no poles, if there's no structure, if there's no structural momentum, then you can't build anything upon it. I talked to you last week about how that is so key, it is important, that the poles that hold our life up, if you will, is that the first one is the Scripture. That it has to be the God of your life. Everything that you do, it must be the God of your life. If you have a decision to make, you go to the Word of God. And don't tell me that it's outdated and it's old and it doesn't, it's not relevant. I promise you, if you will give it half a second a chance under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, there is an answer and a God for every decision in every area of your life and every season of your life. It has to be the God of your life. It also has to be the governed body of your life. That means that it rules your life. That every decision, not only are you guided by the principles that are taught in the Bible of God, uh, the Word of God, the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E, but that it governs your life, that we don't do anything outside the Word of God, that this is, this is the absolute truth of God. There is nothing higher. There is nothing that has more authority in this world or in eternity than the Word of God. I also taught you that the poles are the foundation of the structural momentum of your life and the reason that you will not continue to go forward or not reach new heights in 2019 is because you're not starting with the Bible. The second is that, is that not only do you, do you not have those scriptures, but you've you got to have some standards about yourself. These are our core values. It's something that we're changing here at One all across the board, that our mindset is different and that we have these standards about us. That we are not easy and that we are not cheap and that we don't do things with, with half a bit of quality, but we do it with a bit of excellence in all that we do. That we do stand for something. And so those are the poles that, that, that are the standard of our life that actually cause the structure to be solid and that will cause momentum in our life. The last one last week was that you and I have to have the right sight. you got to see. you got to have vision. Vision equals hope. If all I can see is right in front of me, how absolutely miserable would my life be? If all that there is for me is right now, and I mean, I got it good. I have a, a wonderful wife, great kids that are brats most of the time, but, but that's my fault for spoiling them, all right? It may be some of their aunts and uncles' fault too, but, but, but you, you get it, right? I got a good life now, but, but if, if this is all there is, if this pain and this struggle and this disease and this sickness and this, and this struggle financially and all these things, if that's all, if it's just right now, if all I see is what is right now, how miserably sad and how depressing and how defeated that will be. But because I'm in Christ, I know that I'm walking from victory. I'm walking in victory, that I will in all things be more than a conqueror, that I am a child of God. And if he be for me, who in the world could ever come against me or stop me or stop the progress or plan of God? That's the right sight. Vision's powerful. Hope is powerful. Hope is that that tells a person when the, when, when, when the doctor says you'll never walk again and yet they're walking now. Hope is that that helps a person get through a season of tragedy, then they say you'll never ever or you won't or it can't be. Hope is that that says no in all things, it is possible with Christ. Those are the standards, those are the structural momentum. And this week I want to move to the systematic momentum. Because he said, all right, you got to have the poles. So we set it up. Anybody been camping at any point in your life, if you don't put the poles up right, the tent's not going to stay. If you build a teepee, if you don't put the sticks up right, it's not going to stay. 
So this is exactly what he's talking about in our life, is that these are the structural foundation. The next is the system. And so when we put those things in place, this is what we begin to add to it. You following me? I don't want to lose anybody, but I do want to try to teach you and not just be one of those uh, bring it, yell it, pep rally preachers. I want to equip you. So the one thing I want you to leave this week is this, is that, is that I want you to focus on how God has a system for things. Do you, do, you, do you remember in the Bible where it says that our God is a God of order? So it's all about the order. It's all about the order. It's, it's not about a sense of who's better than, than the other. So as we move forward, I want you to know that if you are going to reach new heights, if we are as a church, which starts individually in your family, come together corporately and do more in 2019, grow more, go faster, go further, stronger, together, momentum, these are the things that has to happen, the systems that we must follow. And so I, the tent was what I see as the representation of the systematic momentum. He said, hey, I need you to pose, and then I need you to put the tent or the coverings up. Well, in our lives, there's, there's a sense of order to it. So I wanted to pick a few things. Now, it's going to take me a few weeks to develop all of these thoughts, y'all okay with that, right? There'd be more than one week because if I kept you here, you would be complaining that. And really, the children's workers, they'd be complaining because we'd be here to 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. All right? So I just want you to focus on one thing this morning, all right? I just want you to focus on one thing. The first thing that I want us to look at under systematic momentum, under the, what covers us, what we build on top of it, what comes first when we have the scripture in place, the core values in place, and we have hope in Christ, our sight is fixed on him, and we move forward, what we add to our life next, this is what I want you to write down, family. Family. I find it interesting that a lot is being put on the church today. A lot of emphasis on building the church, building the church, building the church, building the church. What, what's interesting to me and what's baffling to me is that God didn't establish the church first. That he established the family first before he established the church. Of course, the way the Bible talks about church, most of us don't do church that way. But that's a different series and a different sermon. But family must be first. So if I get the, if I get the structural momentum right... And I begin to add to it now the covering, the systematic momentum, I've got to have the family values. I've got to understand what is the order, if you will let me. What is the system for family? And I just want to break that down very quickly. I, I don't want you to turn there. You with me? Say amen. amen. I, uh, I, well, I don't want you to turn there, and it's not on the screen. I just want you to listen. But if you take notes, I want you to write down this, this, this side note of, it's for Scripture. Colossians chapter 3. 18 through 21, Paul Wright at the Church of Colossae. I want, you to, I want you to listen to what he says about the family unit. This is one of many places he talks about it. We're going to talk about the systematic momentum for our family. How do you want your family to listen? Some of you going, I don't have a family. I don't, I, listen, I just got out of a situation. I don't hope I ever. I'm never in that again. Listen, these are good standards across the board. You will find yourself in one of these, you will find your, yourself in one of these positions or, or places in your life. So I want you to listen. Don't turn me off or tune me out, Okay. All right? Here's what, here's what Paul said in Colossians 3, 18 through 21. Here, just very, very quickly, listen to me. Wives, submit to your husband as it is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. Verse 20, children, Lana, always obey your parents. Addie's not with us this weekend. For this, Lana, pleases the Lord. For this, Lana, pleases the Lord. For this, Lana, okay, you get it. Father, listen to me, verse 21. Fathers, do not, Lana, you can throw this one right back at me, I know. Do not aggravate your children. Do not aggravate your children, or they will become discouraged. We're talking about the momentum or the movement of the body of Christ. I'm not talking about the church as we see it as a building or a group of people. I'm talking about the family unit. And we have the structural momentum. We understand the poles is a part of it. And we understand now that the systematic momentum, we're going to start with a family because that is the very first thing that is established. Over the next few weeks, we'll talk about under systematic, we're going to talk about finances and function, and everybody has a place in here, the function of finances, that's easy to understand, all right? 
to give, save, and to live. That's the three main principles. We'll talk about that next week. This week, let's just focus on family. Family. I have two thoughts under this systematic momentum about family. Just two thoughts this morning. And I just want you to focus on this family, right? The first one is this. The first one is this. Is to understand your role. To understand your role. You know, life works a whole lot more efficiently and effectively if everybody just knows their role, right? If everybody just knows that this is what we do and I'm going to do what we do well. Just, I give you an example. I say it all the time. With Pastor Thad and myself, we established really at the very beginning of our journey together. He does the singing. I do the preaching. And we don't mix those two things up much at all. And so far, it's worked pretty well. The times they've left my mic on and they can hear me singing, you can see the band going nuts up here because it's in their ears and they're like, cut him off now. By the way, band, if you heard me scream this morning after I turned it on, it's because this little clip got a piece of this fat roll right here, and it hurt like nobody's business. So just putting it out there as a side note, if you heard me kind of uh, real quick, it was that it got a little bit of that cheeseburger in there, okay? Back to the main thing. If everybody understood their role, we, we, live, in a, we live in a day and an age where everybody wants to be in charge. Everybody thinks they know best. And they use that social media platform to let us know that they know best. And then when they catch a little flag, they really quick to back up, call it audible, and, 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 and talk about everybody else. And, and, and the simplicity of it is this, if you just understand your role. Most of the time, the family, the reason that they're dysfunctional and the reason that they, they, they have such a, a, a difficult time is because most people just don't know the simplicity, uh, do not understand their role. And it's simple. It's simple. And so I just want to break it down very quickly. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. And, and, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not paid by anybody. They didn't nobody's wife or nobody's husband or nobody's ex. Nobody's, I don't have anybody saying, hey, I'll give you an extra hundred this week if you'll say this at this point. I don't, I don't not, this is strictly as God is leading me and how we try to lead in our home, all right? So let's just look at our roles and understand those roles. Let's, 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 let's start with the wives. Let me say this too. A lot of times... We look at it and you say, well, God's word, since it's the authority, right? It's the standard. It's the absolute truth. He knew that he needed to start with the wives because they're, you know, give us the most trouble. That is absolutely false. The reason, I mean, seriously, and, and again, I'm, I'm just one of those Bible geeks. The reason Paul writes is very intentional. The reason that he says, and he starts with the wives, is simply because in this day and age, the, the, most women were looked at as just another possession, literally. Now, I'm not, and I'm telling you, this is Bible times. This is not my heart, mama, okay? I would like sugar. You know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? I love you. They looked at their wives as their livestock, as livestock, same, equal. It's just a possession to them. Now, you think that's outlandish and that's crazy and it's like that's offensive. Did you know there, there are a lot of men that they may not say it that way, but they continually in the 21st century look at their wives and even their children as just possessions? You're just there to please me. And so in, in Jesus' day, in the biblical times, I'll say it that way. I won't say in Jesus' day, but in, in Jewish society, the women didn't have any value. And so Paul is writing, he's like, listen, this is what God is doing. And remember, God says that, that we're equal. Right? The whole basis of what, how we named our church come from one of his letters. It's the, the letter to the church at Galatia. And he says that we, there's no male, nor female. There's free or bond. There's slave. There's no Jew. Listen, at barbarian, we're all one. But he starts with the wives, so I'm going to start with the wives. So I'm not saying that, Sandra, you need more work than me, okay? I didn't say that. What are the wives' role? What is, it's just simple, right? I don't understand there's books that line the shelves. There's, there's all kind of seminars. There's all kind of conferences. It's just real simple. The wives, what does it say to do? I, I mean, I just kind of in bold mind, it says that you are to submit. Submit. There's a system to everything. God said, I, I'm a God of order. And if you want things to work well, if you want things to catch momentum, if you want to do more, if you want to glorify God, listen, if you want it to honor him, then you do it like he wants it to be done, and the wives are to submit. Now, the problem with that is this, is that in our English language, we don't like that word submit. You submit to me. I mean, you see how dumb that sounds? I mean, do you, and most of you know us well. 
I'm, you submit to me. That is not going to work well in my house. It's because we don't understand what he's, what he's saying here. Again, we don't understand our role. And, and, and literally, this, this word submit, it means, yes, submission, but it does not mean inferiority. We're equal. Man, we're partners. She's the, she's the bonnie to this client. I don't know if that's a good way to say it. They were outlaws. Died in a hell of gunfire. Feels like that sometimes in our home, don't it? <laughs> We're partners. Wives, you don't understand your role that you are to be submissive, yes, but it's not that you're to be in fear. You're not a doormat. Submit literally in this, in this, in this writing. It literally is a military term, and it, and it carries with it the idea that, that we, listen, that it's arranged by order of rank, that you come up under. What he's saying is this, is that we're partners in this, but just like, let's think about military. How many military do I have? I know that I, I, I've got several that, that are military, military-wise, military, you know what I'm saying? We're built, right. In, in military, a private and a colonel, well, the private's not inferior. He's not less of a person. He's not less valued. They just have what? Different roles. They have different responsibilities. And so if you understand your role, if you want momentum in your family, if this year you want your family to be tighter and deeper and more in love and, and more, uh, more uh, uh, mission-minded and, and, and all those things that you desire for your family unit at any stage of it, it don't matter if you're an empty nester or you've got grandkids or you're, whatever, if you want your, your unit to work this way, then you've got to follow the guidelines, the systematic, the order that God established. And he says, wives, you're simply to submit the picture. Listen, I, lo I love it. It is. It is literally, you, you're listening to me? I am a Bible geek, and this is so powerful. He, he, broke the, he broke the tabernacle down into three, right? Poles, tents, articles in the Holy of Holies. You and I are the temple of God. Mind, body, soul, spirit. This, this wives, listen to me. So next time you have a difficult time following your husband, and I'm going to get to us men in a moment. The next time you have a difficult time understanding what it means to really submit, I want you to understand that when he, when he writes this, it is, literally, it is literally a word picture for the Trinity. You see, in the beginning, God created us, right? And he said he made man in his image, in our image. It literally says that. It's plural. It's in our image. He's talking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, now listen to me. I, I know that it is absolutely a difficult theological thing to explain, but God is a triune God. He's three in one. He's the Father, He's the Son, and He's the Holy Spirit. And they're all equal. Don't, don't you feel that, that, that they're all equal? That one is as great as the other? Well, it is exactly that way. They have different functions. They have different roles. They perform different things, but they're all equal. And so when, when we look at the family unit and the wives' role in that is to submit, it literally means that we are to arrange in order of rank. It is to simply say that I'm just trying to be a picture of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And one of the beautiful aspects of the Trinity is God the Father. Listen to me. God the Father, he, doesn't, he does not dominate or force Christ into submission or to submit to him. It is done out of love. It's beautiful. In the garden, are you with me? You see, you didn't have a clue I was going to go here with submission, wives. In the garden, Jesus takes a knee, and he's under such intense pressure because he's about to be executed on the cross. It said his capillaries burst into bloody sweat drops of blood. And for me, the victory was won in the garden. It's not on the cross. The cross is part of the process. Trust the process. But it was not won there. It was won when he was down on his knees and he was sweating drops of blood. And he said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. It was arranging the order of rank. It is my job to go to the cross and be the propitiation, the sacrifice, the atonement for the others. The sins of the world. And so when we look at the family unit and we look at the wives and their submission, that is what he says to do. No matter how you slice the bread, it is to come up under and say, okay, sir, Mr. Husband, whatever you, whatever you want to say there, or if you're a single mom that you follow under the father himself and you say, I am your 
child. I will serve you. Or if you're in a marriage that you say, okay, we're going to pray together. We're equal. I don't have a great thought that don't originally come from Sandra most of the time. I got called out by two of y'all yesterday about that. Our wives that were communicating, and he said that neither one of us have any good thought unless it first comes from them. Uh, I simply said, amen. They have different roles. So you to understand your role. The, the, wives, submit. It's just that simple. Submit. Submission means this. It doesn't mean that you're a doormat or I can bo boss you around, order you around, or you should ever be done that way. For sure does not mean abuse, verbally or physically. It is a beautiful picture of the Trinity. God the Father saying, here's what's got to be done. And the Son saying, I submit. Because we agree that this is what's best. The reason we struggle so much is we're trying, trying to go in two different directions when God says he can't bless it unless it's unified. Amos would write, how can two walk together unless they first be agreed? Prophet in the Old Testament. The, the next thing he says in understanding your role is wives submit. He says this is his husband's love. Just love. You want your wives to submit. You want your family to run and have momentum and go deeper and further and get stronger. Then you must love. And this love is, and I'm not going to harp on this thing. I'm just going to go through it very quick. Love, this love is sacrificial. It's sacrificial. It, it, listen, ladies, if, we, if, if you're not being loved in a sense that they're willing to sacrifice for you, then you're not being loved like Christ loved the church. And I would like to think in my home, sometimes, sometimes it equates to, I watch things like Hallmark Channel movies, well, at least five minutes of it, that's sacrifice. No, I'm not talking about little things like that, superficial. Talking about spending time in front of the Lord saying, I love my family. God, keep my family. God, give my family. Keep my daughters close and clean. Keep my daughters pure until the time that they marry and, and you give them who you've established for them. God, give them a mission in their life. God, protect Sandra today. God, use her in the classroom to be a light in this world. Sacrifice. I know we're busy and we don't have time. Sacrifice. That's the love he's talking about. It's sacrificial, it's genuine. It's honest. It's real. You see, real, genuine love, it tells you the truth, even when it hurts. Real, genuine love tells the truth, is honest, even when it hurts. It also is willing to have that in return. Love, sacrificially love, genuine. This kind of love, husbands, it's nurturing. It's encouraging. One of the things that, that I'm trying to focus on in, in my life, man, I, I am quick with my words. I am quick with my words. I am, I am, I am probably lean more toward verbal abuse than any other thing in my life. And I, I, I mean, I'm just being transparent with you. I mean, I, I just can, in a minute, I'm just, I am ill and complain and negative and, 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 and just everything around me. And man, that, that absolutely can, can do so much damage. When is the last time you said something encouraging? When's the last time that you've taken the time to just encourage? Hey, hey men, when's the last time you slowed down long enough to just listen to them? Man, I struggle with it. I, tell, I, I, am, I am the world's worst. I would be like, Sandra, get to the point. It's quiet in here. Man, I want momentum. If we're going to have a church that's going to do incredible things, I'm talking about the size of it, but I'm talking about the quality of it. It starts with the family. It doesn't matter if you're in a blended family. It doesn't matter if you're in, in the third family that you've been. It doesn't matter about that. It. It's about doing it right and with quality in the one that you're in. He said, well, my kids are, this, it didn't matter what stage they're in. It means I said, I'm going to make a decision right now, and I'm going to myself. My mindset this year, any negative thought that comes my way, whether it's church-related, family-related, finance-related, I don't care. I'm going to immediately crush it and say, look at the things I've got to be blessed. 
and got to celebrate over. And I'm going to encourage her and not criticize her. This kind of love, you, you know, most of the women, and the last one is consistent. You see, men, you can't just love when you want something. Or we can be sweet when we want a little sugar. Honey, you look good today, sweet thing. Rest of the time, we don't even have time to listen to them. You see, this kind of love is consistent. It's intentional. It's sacrificial. It has a purpose. It encourages. It nurtures. It says, I'm here to protect you and to keep you. And I will explain that in greater detail before we leave this morning. This is what it is about. And the reason most of us, we have a dysfunctional home is because, men, we want to be heads of our home. And God has called us to be the head of our home. Don't be mad at me. I'm not a chauvinist. I'm just biblically based and trying to do it as God would have me to do it. And it is always work, I promise. But the reason our wives won't follow and the reason our children won't follow is because we're not giving them anything to follow. Why would they want to love you back when the only time you want to love them is when you want something in return or you've done something stupid and you want to get, uh, I'm sorry, it's okay. But it's not what he's talking about. Systematic momentum starts with a family, understanding your role. Then it says this, it says husbands, love, wives, obey, children, I mean, children obey, wives submit. Children, you just simply obey. C.S. Lewis said it this way. He said, if the home is to be a means of grace, it must be a place of rules. I think I always ask the teachers that are here, you have any kids that are in your classroom that you can tell they ain't in the rules at home? You know, you know that they're spoiled, self-entitled. Brats. You know what I mean? Oh, wait, listen, listen. I'm as guilty as charged. I've been through that season. I've been through that season. Every time Addie didn't get something she wanted, she, she, she figured out real quick. She couldn't communicate good with her words, but she, ah, ah, and just continued to scream until one of us said, okay, I'm going to give you what you want. Home has to have rules. Church has to have rules. Do you understand, kids, why it is important that we discipline you? It's because we love you. I had a whole bunch of stuff here, but I, 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 really, I really need to hurry on. But do you know that statistics tell us that, I mean, it, it, is, it is worth noting here, seriously, parents, foster parents, grandparents, if you messed up with the, the, the child, you, you can work with the grandchild, okay? Listen, help him out, okay? Help her out. Listen to me. Listen to me. That it is worth noting that a child that does not obey his parents and everything and recognize their authority, then the child will not recognize other authority as they grow up. Statistically, the number is greater. If you do not have rules in your home, this is why God said, here is understanding your role. Here's the systematic momentum. Here's how I want you to do it. There is an order to it. There's an order to it. Children, obey your parents. I don't care if it's not your biological parents. I don't care if you're being raised by your grandmama or grandpappy, auntie, uh, uncle. I don't care. Children, obey. Obey. Because what we teach you now will help you later in life. Brandon, I, I, I say this all the time. I used, to get, I used to get so mad when Dad would have us cut the grass, wash the cars, especially before we had a riding lawnmower. I hated to push mow the grass. Absolutely detested. And I used to hate when Mom would say, listen, we, we got to clean it. We have to dust. And not only do we have to dust, we had to dust every doodad. Our mom had all kind of doodads, right? You know, you know what doodads are? I don't know if they have those uh, in your neck of the woods. But in my neck of the woods, it just doodads. Let me just go real. Because my mama, God rest her soul, really it was just junk. <laughs> all right? Souvenir stuff, but it's stuff that meant something to her. And, and, and I only have to dust, we have to dust every, every, I mean, every single one. And now I'm a parent, and, I, and my girls, listen, we got to clean your room. You gotta, and I mean, when you clean your room, I mean, you got to get under the bed, you got to get in the closet, you got to do all these things. This is what I'm asking you to do. Hey, listen, here's the, another rule that we're enforcing in our house, okay? I'm just, this is good therapy for me. If, 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 you, if you're in the shower, when you get out of the shower, take the hair that you leave in the shower with you because it belongs to you. 
That's a new rule in 2019. Right, Mama? If it, if it is their hair, they take it with them. There's rules. And I would be so mad that we have to do these things growing up, but now I'm glad because I, I have a bit of OCD. And I can understand, I can understand when Lana and Addie give me buck back, when they give me attitude back, when they huff and puff and they roll their eyes or they raise their eyebrows or what, what, what the little things that they do to let me know, hey, we really don't want to do that. I don't care if you want to do it or not. I said, do it, you do it. You wanted a dog, then walk the dog. I mean, how many parents have ever been there? We want a dog, 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 want you're going to walk the dog. I don't care if it's dark or not. I do believe in Bigfoot. Yeah, he might be out there. But that's all right. I tell him, I said, hey, walk the dog. The dog's got to poop. Let him go. It's got to be orders. I'm being funny, but you understand what I mean? It's got to be orders. It's got to be. Do you know, there's another thing about growing up. I didn't get, this is the truth. I did not get in trouble until I finished school. I don't know if that makes it any better, but I didn't get in trouble through 12th grade. You know why I didn't get in trouble at school? I didn't want to go home if I got in trouble. I got, I got in trouble a few times, but because I got in trouble those few times, I knew when I got home, it was double. I told you this story before. I got caught in the, in, I think I was in the, I was in the fourth grade. I got caught copying a girl's paper. I was dumb then, right? I'm a little bit brighter now. I copied verbatim. I should have messed some things up. You know what I'm saying? She knew, the teacher knew I'm not that bright, right? But, but so when, when I got caught, Miss Owens, she busted me. And, 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 and so I, 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 they called my mom, but I got paddling. Miss Owens paddled me. And I'll never forget this. When she calls mom in, she, she, she said, he's all worried. Tell Mr. Hendricks he's already been punished. And my mom literally laughed out loud. I don't mean to, I don't mean to hashtag it or anything. She said, ha, ha, yeah, yeah that ain't going to happen. Bill Hendricks going to wear him out. And sure enough, I got it. He said, why? I'm just saying that my girls understand that, that I rule my house. Now, as they get older, they're teaching me to have a better ability to communicate. So, yes, we can discuss some things. But now, let me tell you where we've gone in that adventure. I don't know if anybody can relate to this in your, in your years or in that season for you now. Now, I'm okay with having a conversation and talking it out. Plus, it helps me to cool down. But I'm only going to go so far. I ain't into this all touchy-feely, all this stuff. I know God gave me a bunch of girls, right? But, I'm, I mean, listen, I, I don't, I, let's get to the point. Tell me why you did why you didn't do it, and let's get on with it. Now, all this, all this on and on and on and frilly stuff, I'm not, I'm, listen, I'm not, I'm not going to listen to none of that. I don't have time for that. Let's get to the point. And, and I want you to understand that, 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 kids, the reason we want you to obey is because, and I tell the girls this all the time, and I know I'm using my family's illustration, but that's because I don't want to use yours and know mine better than yours. I tell them, I, listen, they have never been 43. I have been 13. And I want them to understand that the things that I have done and the mistakes that I have made, I don't ever want them to ever go through those things. I don't ever want them to touch a drug. I don't want them to ever touch a, uh, any, any alcohol. I don't want them to ever, I don't want them to have premarital sex. I do not, want, I want them to get the education. I want them to go as far as they possibly can into the education. I, 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 want, I want all these things for them. But mom and dad or grandparents or guardians or whoever it may be, you, your job and my job right now is literally to be the guardrails. It's to guide them. And kids, if you get so aggravated at us, and, and, and I used to think my, I thought my mom and dad were the dumbest people. I mean, they were absolutely, I would, listen, I'm ashamed. I'd go behind my, I would not do it in front of them. But when I got behind the closed door, I would let them know something. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'd tell them. I didn't say it out loud, all right? I'd give them a sign language every now and then, too, but I'd let them know. And I know sometimes we feel so out of touch, but all it is is that we're doing what God has called us to do. And your job, I don't care if you feel like that you're going in the wrong direction, your job is to obey. Your job is to obey. The, the last thing under this, under this systematic momentum, the children, is, is, he, is he says father. If you read, even in the New Living Translation, it says fathers. Don't, don't, don't aggravate. The word there it is, is really not father. It can be translated father. That's why when they translated it, it's the word father. But over in Hebrews eleven twenty three, 23, it is the same Greek word there that's used when it talks about Moses' parents hiding him. So the word is not father. It's not just us dads. Because some of you are saying, yeah, my dad aggravates me all the time. It's not just the dad. The word there literally means parents don't aggravate them. And it's not talking about picking on them. I live to aggravate my girls. I mean literally aggravate the snot out of them. It's not talking about that. 
What he's talking about, you see, children, you're to obey us, but you obey us just like wives, you are to submit, but because us husbands, we love you like Christ loved the church. And kids, you're to obey us because why? We're parents like God wants us to be, and, 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 and this is how he literally don't want us to do. You see, we aggravate them. We aggravate them when we don't discipline them. Did you know that you're doing your child more? Look, I don't know about all this time out crap. We tried it. I mean, I, I'm telling you how bad it was. That, now, we're into a different season now as teenagers, but it's so bad that, you know, I, we had to time out and whip. You know what I'm saying? Like, one didn't work. I mean, I needed to multitask in that sucker. You know what I'm saying? I'll sit you down, but on the way sitting down, let me tear you up. You know what I'm saying? I, I, your kids are probably better than that. My mine are, you know, hellions, but I mean, it is what it is, okay? All right, but, 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 but if you don't discipline them, you, you're literally, literally saying to them that you don't love them. You're, you're, you're setting them up for failure. One of the things that I, one of the things that, especially in, in this day and age, one of the things that we, we teach our, our daughters is this, is that I, I do not care. I do not care if you think you've done right or wrong. I do not care if your teacher or coach says to you, do this or don't do this, or you get in trouble. You say, yes, ma'am, no, sir, I'm sorry. And then if there's something greater, mom and dad will take care of it. That way when they get to where they're driving and an officer pulls them over, they say, yes, sir. They say, no, sir. They say, yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. If you say I was speeding, I was speeding. If you said I did this or I did that, this is like, what would you have me do, officer, sir? When they meet another individual, it's miss or it's sir. I don't require them to call me sir don't, when they're in trouble. With, what's your answer? Yes, sir. But also that, it's just dad or yes. I'm not down with this. You. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I do want a little bit of vocabulary there. But you get what I'm saying? I, I want to teach them to respect. Do you know something? My dad, my dad, he said this is last year to work. We talked last, 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 we talked every week, we talked last week about it. And he said this is his, really his last year to work, that this is the year he's going to retire. He's been saying that for a while. And he said this is the year he's going to retire. And, uh, and he's old enough, he's been old enough to retire, so that gives you an idea of his age. But you know if I hang around my dad, my dad showed me a lot of things not to do, but he showed me a lot of things to do. And if I hang around my dad and go to work with him, you know one of the things that I pick up real quick that had not changed at all, he still says yes sir and no sir and yes ma'am and no ma'am to his employees, to his employers. He's always fought, spoken with a bit of respect to everybody around him. And I can't tell you how many times in my adult life I've been told, don't say yes, ma'am. You don't have to say that. And I'll say, well, I'm sorry. I, I just have a habit. It's the way I was raised. You see, we, we, we don't discipline our kids. Then we aggravate them. The, other, the flip side of that is if, if we improper, if we're improper or we go overboard in our discipline, can I say to you as someone that knows and deals with this on a regular basis, you should never, ever, ever let your emotions get the best of you as a parent. I'm guilty as charged. I told you sometime back, we, we had the conversation. My girls are getting older, so it, 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 it's moved into this arena. I, I would get so frustrated because I couldn't get Addie. Addie is absolutely me made over. I mean, I, mean that, I, I cannot falter. I'm trying to raise her right and trying to discipline her, but God, it makes me so mad because she does those things that I do and I see it in her, right? And so I get so aggravated and I, and, and, and I do land it the same way and I, would, I, I wouldn't want to whip them, right? But I'd be so worked up that I would take the belt and I would slam it on whatever's near me, like the table or anything, and I would wham! And I was like, get your attention, right? And so Addie, she's real emotional. We're, we're hot and heavy into it, man, and we're having, we're having a daddy-daughter moment, man. It ain't good. It's ugly. It's done, it's done went into the bedroom. She slammed the door. I've kicked the door in. I said, I'm going to show you how to do it. Right out of my door. I'll take it off the hinges, by God. And I'm, 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 I'm mad, man. I got the belt in one hand, and I'm slamming against the wall. So you pay attention to me. Look at me when I'm speaking to you. And so she, she in the midst of all that, she's crying, and she's beginning. I'm so embarrassed by this, but this is the truth. I'm being real with you. She began to talk to me, and she, she said, I, I wish you would stop doing that. All you're doing is trying to scare me. <laughs> She's absolutely right. I was so caught up in my emotions, so frustrated that she wouldn't listen because I, I know best for her, right? That's why it's important that children obey. It works both ways. But I'd gone, I'd gone overboard. 
I'd let my, I'd let my emotions get the best. I'd let my frustration get the best of me. I mean, gosh, I was telling them, I remember, because they're all like Papa Bill, Brandon. I'm so glad you're here this morning, man. I love you, boy. Uh, that old Papa Bill, he's such a sweetheart. Papa Bill, I was like, man, the Papa Bill you see right now ain't the Papa Bill that raised me and Bubba. I'll tell you that right now. I watched him clear a kitchen out one morning with an ironing board. I ain't, you think I'm kidding like a helicopter. Us knuckleheads, uh, we, we, we wasn't easy to raise. He, you were worse than me. I'm telling you now, if you don't discipline, you're setting them up for failure. But if you discipline them from a place of emotion, if you make any decision based on your emotion, you're making terrible mistake and you're setting yourself up for great failure. Let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me say this, understanding your role, understanding your role. The, let, me, let me end with this out of time. Not only do I want you to understand your role, now don't pack up, I want you to listen to me, okay? Understand your role about family. These are the two things, right? But I also, also think it's important that not only do you understand your role in a family, but you, you have this. Listen to me here, because it all leads to this. Unconditional love. Unconditional love. Unconditional love. Write this down as a side note. It's one of my favorite verses of Scripture. And as you spend time with me, I have a lot of favorite verses. This is my, one of my favorite, though. In Luke 6, 35, listen, listen to this. Please be still. I, want you, I really want you to hear this. The Lord is kind... The Lord is kind to those who are unthankful and are wicked. Now, before you get an image of someone in your mind, I'm often very unthankful and very wicked. And I am grateful that God is kind to me when I am unlovely. We had a situation. And I'll, just stay, I'll just stay with my family. I was going to tell you about other people in the journey and stuff I've been. I've, I know some stories from parents. But let me tell you one that just happened. I mean, literally just happened this past Wednesday. One of the things that we do, you're with me, right? One of the things that we do in our home, one of the, one of the areas of discipline now, understanding our role in unconditional love. I want you to think about family this morning. Is we take the girl's phone, and, and, and Sandra does. I, I, I very seldom do it until she says, look at this. One of the things that we do is we take the, the girl's phone, we open them up, and we just read the text, read messages and stuff that we can see. And we have, you know, it's, it's wonderful, too, now that you can, you can set it up. It's so funny. Uh, Addie said, she's like, send me a screenshot. Um, I said, what is this? It's, it's her time had run out. We only, we, only give them, we only give our kids three hours a day. I know they're teenagers. We only give them three hours a day of, of screen time. They can use the phone all the time because a lot of times they're not with us, and I want to make sure. But we, we, had, we had this situation because if you're not monitoring the phones, mom and dad, I want to just say this and don't be mad at me. You dumb. You dumb. Foolish. We had a situation Wednesday, though. Sandra saw something, and, and one of the girls, I won't say which one, I'll try not to, and one of the girls, and, and so we had a deep discussion, but now uh, it, was, it was Thursday. It was Thursday. Thursdays are chaotic, right, Coach? They're, they're, I mean, Thursdays, a couple days a week are really, really hard for us um, because by the time they get out of school and we get home, it's about 4. They, they've got to be back on campus at the, at the gym by uh, really 15 to 5 or a little before 5 to get ready for the games. And so we had this deep discussion, and they were actually late this, this Thursday by a few minutes. Um, I was hoping we built up enough bank in the other days, being there early, but, but it's still, it still is what it is, and they're late. But, and that, wasn't a, that was not a plug either there, Coach. Uh, run them extra laps, please. Um, burpees. But we had a situation with one of them, and we got really heated. They, they chose to use words. You know, like, we, we, have a, we have a difficult time with some of the phrases they say. Like, they'll say, I'm dead. Or, or here, here's the one that, that was the big conversation. I'm just killing myself. I'm telling you, especially the season we, we, we're in right now, I, I don't think that's a funny thing to say. I buried him. So we had a really deep discussion about it, and it was all, I mean, we, man, it was, it was, it was, I was upset. Because they, they literally didn't mean it that way. They're just joking. You know, they're being facetious, even though they don't know what that word means. <laughs> they, they, they think, it, they, they're just being, they're just like, 
you know, being extra with it, like, you know, so bad. I just don't think it's something to joke about at all. Never, ever, literally, never. And they were upset with us. And I'm going to be honest, I was upset with them. But we come to a calm place, we got over to the field. But, but, but the whole time, the whole time during, during, during the game, two games, they never come and talk to us. This particular daughter of mine stayed away from me and from Sandra. And so after, even late that night, e e the next morning, I asked, I was like, why did you do that? Because when they wake up and they come into the kitchen in the morning, one of the first things we do is I, I usually either scratch their back or put them in a big bear hug or if I'm running late in a bad mood, I was like, get your butt. Anyway, but most times hug. And, and, and so you could feel when I hugged her that it was like a... And I, and, and, and I, I thought, why didn't, you, why didn't you come? You never even spoke to us. You never said a word to us. But yet others would, would, were there, and I saw you talking to them, and, 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 and you were like all happy and all this. And, and listen to me, I'm, 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 I'm going somewhere with this. She said, Dad, I thought your mom were, were mad at me. I said, I'm upset. I was upset, sure. I said, well, I'm going to tell you something. There is nothing you would ever do or say that would cause me not to love you. I love you unconditionally and forever and always. And the father's the same way. He said, there's nothing that you can do. There's nothing that you can do or say that would keep me from love. I love you. And yet why in Romans, in Romans 8, 5, he says this. He, he, he literally says, he says, listen, in 5, 8, he says, he says, and yet while you were sinners, Christ died for you. He said, I love you. You don't have to get, you don't have to do something. This love is not performance based. It's just love. It's family. We may break fellowship for a minute, but we will never break relationship. You are mine, and I love you. Some of you may feel that way. You're like, he doesn't do it. Listen, he loves you. You don't have to do anything. He loves you. And then I think about my own family, too, and I'll just keep it in my arena. Stand with me, please, as we're done. And it, it'll, we'll, we'll have the invitation. I'm, 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 I am, I'm out of time. Stand with me, please. We, we are so blessed with Addison and Lana. A lot of times, a lot of times, if you don't know our story, most of all of you know our story. Lana's our adopted daughter. Lana's, Lana's, Lana's my daughter. Like she told me that I, I could love like this and not, and not be biological. Like I love my wife, but I mean, that's, it's just a different kind of love. And I, I love Lana like my kid, man. I mean, I mean, she's my kid, man. She's my kid, and it's a shame that she's acting like Sandra more and more every day, but it's, it, she's my kid, and, but she, she's, she's, she's taught us something. And so I understand this, 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 this dynamic of what the Bible teaches. Before, I could just preach about it and teach you what the Greek and this, but you know that Paul would write to the church at Ephesus, and he would talk about how you and I, we are adopted into the family of God. We are predestined. We are ad adopted into the family of God. Before, I would just teach you literally, this is, this is what he's saying. This is what it means, but I want to tell you from my heart what I understand it to mean. You know what I tell Lynn all the time? And I, I love, remember, I live to aggravate them. I mean, I mean, aggravate the snot out of them, right? I tell them all the time, I love them. I love them. Because another way that you can, you can aggravate your children is to show them favoritism if you have more than one. I tell them all the time. I tell them all the time, listen, I love you. I love you the same. I treat you. There's one thing our mom tried to do as well. Nanny always, always tried to be equal with us. If you got something the same, you got the other kid got. And so we, we, we talk about this all the time and I aggravate him and I'm like, I love you and we'll get to going and, and Atlanta and Addie will go back and forth and, Atlanta, and Addie will say, no, he loves me more because I'm his, you know, I'm, 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 his, I'm DNA or something, whatever she says and, 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 and this is what Atlanta, and I love it, right, because I taught her well. She'll say this, she says, no, 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 watch this. He chose me. He loves me more. That is a huge biblical principle. Do you know in the process of adoption, listen to me, I'm, I'm done, I promise you, but listen to this powerful truth out of the Word of God about family and about momentum and about how this is the things that cover us. Remember, it's the tent, so it covers sin. Sin is covered, right, by love. 
This is a powerful truth. When you, when you, when you go through a sit like this, the kid, you, you, they, don't, they don't parade the parents in and the kids go, which parent do I want? I want that dad and that mom. That's not how it works. The parents choose the child. And you see, Father, he's in heaven and he says, listen, nobody else may want you. He says, I choose you. And then, and then the father of the world, Satan, he'll, he'll, say, he'll say, God, yeah, but you know, you know how jacked up they are. You know, you know how screwed up they are. You know, you know how broken they are. You know, you know how much trouble they've been. You, you know, he, I still, I want her. And then watch this. This is unconditional love. This is how the family operates. And then he says this. He says, okay. Satan says this. He says, okay, okay, God, I'll give her to you. But you got to give me your son. And the father said, okay. That's how much he loves us. That's the love that we have to have in our families. That's the love that we have to have in our church because we're made of families. Mrs. Selena, but witness to this, and so was Sandra. I wanted her before I could even have her. We're moving into bunk beds even before we could have her in the house. And there is no difference in the love I have for her and the natty. And I don't know how to explain that, but that is exactly what God has put on my heart this morning. The Father loves you no matter what or where you come from. And it cost him everything. But yet he still chose you. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you. Thank you that you adopt us in. And when no one else seems to want us, you're always there for us. Father, I pray that in my home that we will follow the biblical system for the family. And I pray we will love unconditionally. I pray this morning if there's one here that has never experienced that, that, that family, that kind of love, that they would receive you this morning. That those that their family is estranged or they're struggling with bitterness or there's a kid that's here that's been struggling with rebellion. Would you turn that this morning? Would you turn that bitterness into sweetness and that, that pain into joy, that chaos into peace? That we move forward, that we gain momentum. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here this morning and you, Christ, is your Savior, I want you to do something. I want you to say, Jesus. You don't have to say it out loud. You can say it to yourself. I want you to say, Jesus, for there's no other name. Jesus, save me. Forgive me. Thank you for loving me. Help me love myself as you love me. In Jesus' name, nobody looking around. If you're watching online and extended family, please let us know if you have received Christ. If you're here this morning on the count of three, will you throw your hand up if you ask Christ to save you and to forgive you? One, two, three. Say, boo, that was me. I prayed. I asked him, forgive me and save me. Amen. Maybe you're here this morning and you've gotten to a place where it is just routine. There's no relationship there. There's no freshness to it. There's no system to it. There's no momentum at all. It's just going through the routine. It's just going through the motion. This is my job and this is my role. And, it, and God has reminded you this morning that it's so much more than that. Maybe you want to come to the altar as a unit. Take a seat where you are. Maybe you're here this morning. You just simply want to come. Thank God. Maybe you need prayer. Our pastoral staff will be down here. I will make my way down here. Hey, thanks so much for being here with us today. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week online at onechurchsc.org and on social media at onechurchsc. We believe God has something neat to say to you, and our hope is that you feel his love stronger today than ever before. Thanks again for being here with us, and have a great week.